Now for question six. If we haven't seen any cardiac involvement in early tests, do we need to see a cardiologist every year? So individuals with bariatric syndrome are more prone to some congenital heart disease, such as holes in the, the, in the, the what's called the septum of the, of the heart or the ventricle or the, of the ventricle of the heart or some other more complex heart disease. That should be picked up early on. So, so if they've had a thorough cardiovascular evaluation as a young child, then that's, that's good. The individuals with BBS, although do have a higher rate of getting thickening of the heart muscle called left ventricular hypertrophy as they age, usually as a consequence of high blood pressure. Um, so my general co comment to people is that they should see a cardiologist at least once during childhood. And then their, their heart and their blood pressure should be checked closely by their primary care doctor as they age. Um, if they start developing high blood pressure or thickening of the heart muscle, which would have to be seen by a cardiologist, then that, that would mandate further cardiac evaluations. But annual evaluation of the heart by cardiologist is not usually necessary. Question seven. Does everyone with BBS have a learning deficit, other cognitive impairments, neurological or psychiatric issue of some sort? It's important to talk about that. Um, so this is a very good question. So the challenges of learning in Barty Beale syndrome range with some fairly severe issues with learning issues to individuals who have absolutely no learning difficulties and are very, very um, accomplished in individuals. There's a, a paper that was published um, in 2016, I believe, by Elise Hian and her group that showed that about 75% of people with BBS had some autistic-like behaviors, but that varies um, um, significantly from people that have significant challenges to individuals who have uh, just some, um, perhaps some behavioral issues that, such as um, wanting to be by themselves or having difficulty, difficulty with friendships and so on. Um, but everyone with BBS does not have significant learning difficulties. In fact, I believe in this conference, you'll see some individuals who have done very well and graduated from college. Um, I have the privilege of working closely with an individual who is a parent, grandparent, and a family, family and marriage counselor who is doing phenomenal things. I've met that, I've met many other people with BBS who are doing exceptional things. And I think some of the, the things that I'm so impressed with, with many individuals with BBS is their amazing memory for details. I wish I could recall some of the details that, that I, um, I um, noticed that people with BBS just pick up on so well. So the answer to it, um, yes, learning difficulties are, are characteristic, especially speech difficulties, but they're not universal. And the capabilities and the abilities of individuals with BBS are far greater than many people recognize. And so I encourage you, whether it's you as a parent with a child with BBS or you as an individual with BBS, don't let yourself be labeled and kept from the capabilities and accomplishments that you very much can accomplish. Moving on to question eight. What should an IEP for low vision services look like? That's a great question. So IEP means an individual education prep, um, plan, which is developed by schools here in the United States. I'm sure in, in different countries, such as Canada, the UK, Australia, the, uh, Mexico, South America, everyone has a, a way to probably help the school teachers do the very best. But in the United States, we have an IEP. That is a opportunity for school teachers therapists, most importantly, parents, administrators to come together and talk about the care plan for a young person who's got, who's in, in um, school. That IEP should very much reflect the needs of the individual with BBS. On our webpage, www.bbs-registry.org, if you look at the top column, there'll be a place for resource and in that there will be information, a white paper that's been prepared um, for helping individuals develop IEPs specific to low vision. That was prepared um, by uh, Becky Stewart, who is a parent of, an in, of two uh, young people with BBS. She became a teacher of the visually impaired, a TVI, um, and is very, very uh, helpful. Um, uh, that, that was also prepared 
by um, therapists here at the Marshall Clinic um, Center of Excellence for BBS and by Ann Fulton and her colleagues at Boston Children's Hospital. We worked together to develop a, that IEP white paper that I think it really provides a lot of inf good information on low vision services. Now, in that white paper, some of the things that were discussed include the importance of the classroom. Um, it's often important for the student to be in the front of the classroom so they can have the best lighting possible. As you know, darkened rooms often are very difficult for people with low vision. So we recommended that they be in a, a, the front of the classroom. We recommended that they have uh, vision breaks throughout the day because uh, eye fatigue and vision fatigue is a real phenomenon where if you're staring at something for too many minutes, it, the vision starts to become more difficult and um, adapting the classroom for that is important. In the paper, we talk about the importance of low vision um, instructors, um, the importance of mobility teaching. So we advocate strongly for individuals to learn to use a white cane before they've um, had significant impairment in their vision. And that's because oftentimes uh, individuals with um, BBS can see fairly well in a well-lighted area, but if they're going down steps or if there's a pothole uh, in the sidewalk, they won't see that very well. It can fall. We've had several people with BBS who have fallen and broken a limb because they didn't recognize the pothole in front of them. So learning to use a cane early on is extremely helpful. We advocate for that. Um, we also talk a lot in that white paper, which I really wanna emphasize about the transition from high school into college or the transition from high school into the workforce. Um, there mm -hmm. needs to be uh, appropriate services rendered to help with vision skills in that period of time. And so I wanna emphasize that that's a very, very important time to be working with the school and the IEP of that transition from um, elementary school onto high school into the workforce. Um, that's just something that should be very much um, adapted into the IEP. So that's kind of a, a general statement there. I'm glad to hear that in this conference, there'll be information um, on IEP services from some really great individuals. They will give some more additional information. Sounds great. Moving on to question nine. What should my doctor consider when my child has chronic abdominal pain? Important. Now that kind of has some issues that come with, eight, with um, depend on the age. So in young children, especially uh, children that are having difficulties with, with having constipation or they're just not having bowel movements at all as babies, there's something that's called Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung's disease is much more common in BBS than in the general population and re represents a lack of nerves that cause the bowels to push the stool out um, that are uh, absent in the bowel and can lead to severe dilation of the bowel and require surgical intervention for that. And so if it's a young child, I strongly encourage them to be seen by a gastroenterologist and in some cases by a, a pediatric surgeon. But having said that, it's interesting that I, I find that constipation is almost universal in Barty Beale syndrome. And so a effective treatment plan for constipation is very important because that abdominal pain in many cases can be due to severe constipation that needs a clear and well-developed plan for the treatment of constipation. And that plan will need to be changed periodically because one plan does not fit all. It's also important to recognize that there's some other things that can be lurking and can be missed as you, as you deal with just constipation by itself. Celiac disease, which is a gluten intolerance, is more common in BBS. That's an autoimmune type phenomenon. So please make sure that your doctors are thinking about celiac disease. As part of what we do in our center, when people come to the clinic, at least annually, we screen for celiac disease because it surely is there. And we surely identify it on a regular basis. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are also two um, types of um, what we call inflammatory bowel disease that seem to be more common in, in Barty Beale syndrome. And so I encourage individuals that are having significant persistent abdominal pain that they be seen and evaluated. They usually require endoscopy or, sigma or, or, or colonoscopy to make a diagnosis of that. But those are conditions that are more common in Barty Beale syndrome. As individuals get a little bit older, 
we start worrying about other things that can happen other than intestinal problems. And, and one of those includes gallbladder stones or cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis is definitely more common in Bartibule syndrome and needs to be thought of. And so people that are having abdominal pain and potentially having um, gallbladder stones need to be considered and, and treated if it's present. I want to point out something that is in, important for your doctors to remember. And that is, is that the position of the organs in the abdominal cavity can be abnormal in Bartibule syndrome. That's called heterotaxy. And that needs to be recognized as a finding that can be present. And so, so you want to make sure your doctors know that abnormal positioning of the intestinal, uh, the abdominal contents can be present. Uh, using the data from the Cribs Registry, we were able to publish a paper about that. That um, if you're interested in knowing about that, I can surely, if you want to send me an email, I can surely send a copy of the paper to you that you can share with your doctors because I think it's important for them to be recognizing that as well. So that's a, a very broad coverage about abdominal pain. The bottom line is it's common. It needs to be carefully evaluated. And, and fully treated if it's present in your child or in you. Now for question 10. What is on the horizon for therapies for BBS? And will the therapies help me or my child? That is so exciting and so important to talk about. In last year's um, a conference that's still on YouTube and available for you to review, you'll see many of the, the breakthroughs, but I'd like to talk about those for a few minutes. I want to start with the importance of the clinical registry in investigating body beetle syndrome or CRIBS because that has made possible some of these exciting opportunities as things will come forward. So what's some of those opportunities? Well, we mentioned one, setmelanotide, I think is a, it's the first targeted therapy specific to body beetle syndrome. And so in other words, that drug would not necessarily work very well for the average person that's battling hunger, um, obesity and, and the like. It works very well for Barney Bill syndrome because it addresses the exact pathway defect that we see in BBS. And so that's right here on the horizon. I told you earlier in this, in this discussion that that medication should be available in the United States by spring of 2022. I hope it will be available in Canada, Europe, South America, and other countries throughout the world, such as Australia and the like. Um, in the, in the coming year or so, I think it's a, it's a breakthrough therapy. What else? Um, um, so many individuals enjoy the, the presentation by Dr. Arlene Drack from last year. Unfortunately, that's not on the YouTube site any longer. But Dr. Drack gave some wonderful insight into how gene therapy might be available for individuals with BBS. Now, this kind of gets to the importance of knowing what your BBS gene is, because gene therapy will have to be specific to that gene. But I anticipate there will be new breakthroughs as far as treating the eye disease and BBS from the different genes. Um, already, we see a, a, a different genetic disorder, a different form of retinous pigmentosa um, called Leber's congenital amaurosis that has the gene therapy for at least one of its gene that's commercially available. So I think you'll see gene therapy coming of, of very much into the care options for people with BBS in the near coming years. Very, very much, much possible for that. What's else is down the road? I don't know, but I can tell you that the, the, the pharmaceutical companies and other um, like-minded industry is very, very interested in BBS. And why? Partly because the BBS community is so united and so interested in working together. I, as I started the, the, to participate in the septalantide trials back in 2017, I was amazed how many people wanted to do it, not just for their own benefit, because they wanted to make a difference for the BBS community. And I just, I hats off to the BBS community because I know that you want to make a difference and you're willing to step forward and say, I'll try, I'll be part of that trial. And um, I just hang in there. I think there's going to be some amazing breakthroughs in the next five next one, two, five, 10 years, the things that will change your life or the life of your loved one who has BBS. Very exciting. Uh, moving on, what do genetic tests for BBS mean? And what do I do if my insurance company refuses genetic testing? That is such an important thing. Knowing the genes of BBS make a difference. It helps us understand things. 
it comes from from people that have very common BBS genes, such as BBS1, that affects 30 to 40 percent of BBS population, um, to rare genes that may only affect one or two people. Why is that important to know? Well, gene therapy, which I've talked about during this conference, um, is one thing. You cannot do gene therapy unless you know the gene that's defective. And so that's one very important reason for it. Secondly, I really do believe that you have the ability to go back to your doctors and say, there is now targeted therapy specific to BBS that we need to know if we've got BBS or not. Um, so something I is that, that example is that the Sutmalanti has been very nicely effective in people with BBS, but if a person doesn't have BBS and they're given Sutmalanti, it probably won't work very well, um, unless they have one of the other rare syndromes associated with this. And so knowing the gene helps the, the insurance company know whether they can, uh, whether Sutmalanti is going to be a valid drug for them. It's also going to be important for other reasons than that. So for instance, um, I mentioned um, recently this paper that was publishing on genes that, that are associated with kidney failure. And in that, we found several genes that are quite rare genes, but very, very highly associated with kidney failure. Um, one of those genes is also called BBS16 or SDCCAG8, is its um, uh, designation, that is almost universally associated with kidney failure. And so knowing that gene, when your child is young, perhaps two or three years of age, would help us to um, pay really detailed attention to protecting the kidneys. And that applies to other things that not just kidney health, but heart health, intestinal health, and so on. So knowing the gene is important. Now, will insurance companies agree to it? I understand that there's been limitations with that. Um, if your doctor practices in the United States, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals is providing free genetic testing for people with certain situations, especially obesity, even into the adulthood. Um, so there's some ways to get the gene genetic testing done for free, but sometimes it's still not possible. And in those cases, I um, encourage you to meet with your doctor, meet with a geneticist, and see if they can't write a letter specific to your insurance provider saying the importance of genetic testing. Now, I understand I practice in the United States and it might be a little bit different in other countries, but I still think that that's very, very possible with appropriate arguments given to the insurance company to explain why it's important for genetic tests to be done. If you're having difficulties with that and you want content, reach out to me. I'd be happy to work with your provider in any country to give them information about why genetic testing is important. Can't promise it's always gonna work. Can't promise that I have infinite amount of time to, to solve every problem. I'm happy to go to bat for you and help out. Great. Final question. What should I know about dental care and BBS? That is such a great question. Um, I keep referring to the website www.bbsregistry or bbs-registry.org. In that, there's a wonderful, wonderful um, um, information on, on dental health. Part of that was helped by one of the parents, Steve McLaughlin, who um, is a dentist who really spurred us on to kind of say, what can we do to improve dental health for body bill syndrome? And so um, that website, um, uh, that information is on the website. Uh, if you go down the, on the right side of the page, you'll see um, one of the tabs is about dental health and BBS. So what are the issues of BBS in dental health? Um, one is um, the oral cavity tends to be a little bit more narrow. The, the palate is a little bit higher arched, um, which can lead to some dental um, uh, malocclusions. Teeth can be widely spaced or can be um, uh, packed in. So there's, there's a misalignment of the teeth. Um, the dental roots can be shortened compared to where they should be. There can be increased dental irritation or peridot or gingivitis, um, which can occur in it. So it's so important that you get good dental care. On a regular basis, the dental cleans are done, flossing whenever possible, if as, as your child cooperates or as you do it for yourself, can really be very helpful. But I definitely encourage annual evaluations of your teeth because it's so important to be done. We know that dental health affects 
systemic health. And so poor dental care results in increased risk of heart disease and kidney disease. And so I strongly encourage everyone who's participating in this um, to get regular dental care. It will affect not only your teeth and your, your satisfaction with your, your dental health, but also your cardiovascular health your, and your kidney health are affected by it. So it has a lot of benefits to you to take care of your teeth. It's been a, a pleasure to speak with you. And I hope that this information that I've shared with you today will be something that will help you as you take care of yourself or your loved one that has Barty Beetle syndrome. There's so much growing knowledge that's there that's available to you. Now, I've said several times during this presentation that you can reach out to me. And so let me give you a couple of ways you can reach out to me. One is through the, through the CRIPS website, which is www.bbs-registry.org. You can also reach me by uh, contact me at my email address, haws, H-A-W-S dot Robert at Marshfield Clinic, which is M-A-R-S-H-F-I-E-L-D dot org. Now, I know that sometimes people have emailed me. I promise to get back with them and I, I get forgetful and I don't do that. Feel free to email me again. I'm happy to try to help you to the extent I can and work with you. Thank you. Um, we have a great program here at the Marshall Clinic, but there's also great programs throughout the world. And we're happy to work with your doctors, your therapists, your school teachers to try to provide the best help possible for you. So thank you very much and feel free to reach out to me.